Please welcome the legendary Dick Cavett. Speaking of legends. Hello? Yeah, we're here. So Dick, you know, we've had at guests at the forum, we've had President Clinton, we've had Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor, uh, we've had uh, Oliver Stone and Peter Bogdanovich and Sidney Lumet and Barry Levinson, and we had mm -hmm. Alec Baldwin and Richard Dreyfus. And Groucho would say, and I've had Rita Hayward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I, <laughs> but I, I must say, that my parents, if they were alive today, would be most proud that you're here today. That's very touching. Yeah, no, I think that... Uh, loved by dead people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, no, I, I, have, I have a similar anecdote to the experience yeah. you had with Groucho, right? Oh, do you? Yes, you said, at some place, you said that uh, in 1972, you were in the back of a limo with Groucho Marx. And your first thought was, how can a kid from Grand Island, Nebraska, be in the back of a limo with Yes. Grant? How did I get from 820 West 3rd, or before that, across from a pile of sugar beets by the railway track in Gibbon, Nebraska, to being in the back seat with Groucho in his limo taking him away from Carnegie Hall? <laughs> uh, it, it seemed like uh, I had gone through the looking glass. Um, I, I, a lot of experiences like that. It has part to do with why I feel sorry for people who grew up in New York, because they can never have the thrill. No, wait, I'll get to the nice part. Um, <laughs> they never have the thrill of finally getting to New York, in that, as in the old railway, uh, the uh, radio show, you know, and through a 12-mile tunnel and pass a row of steaming tenements, and then Grand Central Station. And I did that. <laughs> and went on to be in the limo with Groucho, and on sh shows with him, and writing for him for two weeks, when he, um, in the interval between, you may recall, when Jack left the bar, left the Tonight Show, my first boss, Johnny was smart enough and contract riddled in a way that he couldn't come on for three months. So hosts hosted The Tonight Show from all over the show. So who, who were they? Were you, oh, Jerry Lewis God. was one? Jackie Leonard, Jerry Lewis, Merv Griffin, who did so well, he was, it was guaranteed he would get The Tonight Show and they would replace their contract with Johnny. People wow. have forgotten that. Merv did so well. He was not happy either. Um, Jackie Le one of the Gabors hosted it. Uh, Mort Saul hosted it. Um, Stephen Eady. Uh, Art Linkletter, the world's greatest joke killer. <laughs> um, I have an example if you need it. Yeah. My friend, the great David Lloyd, we couldn't stand Linkletter from the first day. I've forgotten all the reasons why. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, Dave gave me what Dave called a feeb, a feeble joke, but laugh getter. He said, tonight we're going to do a show all about comedy teams. You know, comedy teams. Laurel and Hardy, uh, Martin and Lewis, Rowan and Rossi, it's so on and so on and so, and Jackie Leonard. Now, Jackie Leonard was a fat man, you see. Well, the joke got a mild laugh in the group, writer's room, but Linkletter decided it might need a little help. So he said, Jackie Leonard, Button, Abbott and Costello, and Laurel and Hardy, and big fat Jackie Leonard, <laughs> who's so fat that he's a one-man comedy team all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> Got just what it deserved. How did but Groucho, to write a line and hear Groucho Marx say it, it gives me goose flesh now thinking of it. How did he do in his two weeks? He did very well. He was very funny. And uh, one guest, the interview wasn't going very well. And the guest, I forget who it was, said, uh, we seem to be running out of material. And Groucho said, and it should be running out of us. <laughs> um, and I, I just happened to remember that one. And I, I enjoyed writing asides for Groucho, Groucho-isms, that would follow a line. And I wrote parenthesis, if line doesn't go great, uh, enough of this bridled hilarity. 
<laughs> and that didn't sound very funny on paper. And when Groucho did it, it got applause. <laughs> <laughs> Having to do with the fact that he had conditioned us that anything he said was funny. And the Groucho sound made a line that might otherwise have been average funny. And Groucho could say in the right context, well, Yazidney could have fooled me and get a huge laugh with it. Now, so. that, what year was that? Oh, I, I'm bad on years, but let's see. So this see. is right before Carson takes Jack over. Jack left the Tonight Show in what, 61 or so? Yeah, Carson starts in the mid-60s. I was writing, yeah, it was. Um, and your show starts, the actual Dick Cavett show, 68. is 69. So, well, for us, actually 68, the daytime show. Right. The later show is 69, yeah. So it was about 60 or so. <laughs> yeah. And um, where was he? I mean, this was, this was uh, almost 30 years since Duck Soup. What did America remember of him at that point? Was he still Groucho Marx in that? Mr. Woody Allen and I had, uh, Woody envied me one thing. I had met Groucho. And uh, he said, I have to meet Groucho. So I arranged lunch at Lindy's, <laughs> the old Lindy's, the real one. And the three of us sat in the booth. I wish I had taped it somehow. But the most interesting part was not laughter, uh, two interesting parts. One, Woody said, it was like sitting with one of my Jewish uncles in a way. <laughs> and yet here he was, this towering genius, uh, at the same time as being Woody's uncle who, as Woody imitating him, would say, try it, you wouldn't be sorry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and the other one was that we had to say to him, do you know how popular you are in this day that colleges have Marx festivals and half the people can't get in, they have to do extra screenings, uh, your movies are rented, even with projectors in those days. And Groucho didn't realize this to the extent that which it was, to which it was true. I told him about going to a festival at the New Yorker Theater a few months earlier, and the lines went to the corner and around that block and around the next, down around the next corner. And he said, is this true? Is, you know. He found out almost the hard way when Animal Crackers was gotten out of storage after so many years and showed at the... Uh, Translux, I think it was. I didn't go that night with him because I had to work somehow. But the next day there was a picture of him like this in a mob of people. He was almost crushed. Wasn't uh, this the story in 1972 at Carnegie Hall? Tell us about that. There was an actual concert in 72. So this is about, what, how many years after the Woody Allen lunch would that have uh, been? Let's see. When would the car... I, I was then on ABC Late Night right, so this um, is when that, car, uh, that thing was. I, 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 my guess would be 72. Right, right. But the Carnegie Could Hall be, was definitely 72. I just don't it, know what, yeah, it was, it was so totally how many years was later than from that? that. Think, because, yeah. you know, he, he now needs yet another reaffirmation. He receives another Almost reaffirmation of how huge he was. Yeah. You reported saying that when you were coming to Carnegie Hall to do the show, you yourself weren't sure how many people would have come out to see him. I sort of thought, I hope this isn't going to be an awful night for Groucho. But he had been on my show a few times by then. And it sounds strange, just somebody stunned me once by saying, you did a lot for Groucho Marx. <laughs> and uh, vice versa. But in a way, it was true. He wanted to come on. He'd been watching me. And uh, I, when I learned that he wanted to come on, he did, of course. I did one show with Groucho that you can, uh, it may cost you something. There are five Cabot Show DVD boxes out, and one of them uh, has this great show with Groucho. It's, it's, it's either the Hollywood greats one or the comedians one. So if I were you, I would go to Amazon and buy both. <laughs> uh, just to be sure, because there's a Groucho on each of them. <laughs> but in this particular show, every single thing he said got a laugh as big as the one just now in the mirror scene. <laughs> But that, that, I remember, that was 1969. Was that, was that yeah, that, that far? Was, yeah, that was, yeah. basically... That early, really. Yeah, that was yeah. 69, which is that classic uh, Cavett show. And then yeah. three years later, you do a, a Carnegie Hall night with him. The Carnegie Hall night was dramatic because um, <clears throat> the curious phenomenon of Aaron 
Fleming had come into Groucho's life, right. a young woman whom Groucho files know a great deal about. She was both good and bad for him. She got him out of depressions of sitting around the house and out into doing work. And their friends hated and loved her for what she did. And there's an interesting book on that called Raised Eyebrows. Um, but this night, I got to Carnegie Hall, had a tux on. They said, you only, Groucho wants you to introduce him. And I, um, I went backstage, and I, he looked dead. He was in the green room, and he wasn't dressed yet. And I thought, this is going to be something out of the Blue Angel. He's not going to make it. Actually, he's 83, if I remember. Was that right? I think he was 83 years old that night. I trust your statistics. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I thought, I just had this flashes of horrible things are going to happen. But I was introduced, and I went out in the Carnegie Hall stage in front of the curtain and did an introduction that's on the recording of this night, which is every kid bought one. Um, and I said, you're going to meet several people here. Um, Rufus T. Firefly, Rufus T. Firefly, applause. Uh, Dr. Hackenbush, applause, and did all the names from the movies. And I thought, I hope he comes on. <laughs> <laughs> and they applauded each one. And I remember looking down and seeing Woody Allen and Diane Keaton in the audience. And but the, the most touching thing was the kids, college kids, came in droves, and about. 20 of them dressed as the brothers, individuals did. There were eight Grouchos and nine Harpos and five or six Chicos. I don't remember a Zeppo. Um, not too surprising. Yeah, and, uh, and some of them didn't get in, hundreds of them. It sold Carnegie out to the ceiling. And they were content just to stay, knowing that he was in there and that they were missing his evening, but they didn't leave. And they got to see him, some of the lucky ones, get into the limo afterwards. So they saw their hero, with me, of course. <laughs> What's the modern analog for that? People dressing up as Star Wars characters. This is yeah. 1972, it's, it's, they're dressing up as Marx Brothers. But these were sweet kids of the kind who were being uh, killed in Vietnam at the same time. Um, and it was... Uh, there was a lot of emotion. Well, Groucho came up alive enough to get through the evening. Had he not been able to speak, they still would have loved him and stayed for the two hours. But he, he told a lot of stories. He had three by five cards. And uh, he played the piano. Did he? He did. Uh, did I'm did not he actually sure. Play? No, Marvin Hamlish did. Oh, right, Marvin Hamlish. Marvin Hamlish, unknown pretty much, was Groucho's accompanist. That he, if when you went to Groucho's house for dinner, as you will recall, um, <laughs> after dinner, Groucho sang Lydia and Peasy Wheezy and stole songs from vaudeville and Father's Day and My God, How That Woman Could Cook in German and English. And Marvin Hamlish would be there playing the piano for a free meal, <laughs> <laughs> which he later could afford. Uh, you're and that was wonderful, stuff. but uh, he, he loved to sing, but the thing he loved most was to write. And he said on a show once, and I didn't really pay as much attention to it as I should have at the time, that of all the talents I have, he said, I'd rather be known for my writing than anything else. He admired writers more than actors. He took me to Hillcrest Country Club once, and we, we uh, turned away from the writer's table, or the actor's table. There were Cary Grant and Edward G. Robinson and some other familiar folks. But George Jessel was telling a joke, so he said, let's go over to the writer's table. <laughs> and there were people whose names were on the screen tonight, Nat Perrin and Arthur Sheikman and legendary Hollywood comedy screenwriters. And, uh, he, he, he liked that the most. My friend Robert Bader has reissued a book that came out some years ago that you really should get if you have any interest in Groucho. And who wouldn't? Um, and it's called 
help me with this. It's got a long title, it's Groucho Marx and says, Other Stories. Short stories. And other short, short stories, stories and miscellaneous writing. Right. And something like that. If you go to Amazon and put Groucho Marx, it'll come up. Robert Bader. And it contains all the evidence of what a wonderful born writer Groucho was. He communed with T.S. Eliot, communicated, or dined with, visited, wrote to writers. He loved Iris Murdoch's novels. Um, he'd rather read than do anything, he said. And uh, he used to said laugh. that's especially true as I get older. He used to laugh, but he knew that you were famously had gone to Yale, and he had just gone to the ninth grade. Oh, yeah. And he used to say that he was better read than you, right? Yeah, I, and I had the feeling that he might have been, because I, I felt funny that I couldn't. Oh, someone oh, poured I water. <laughs> Come on, that's like a Marx Brothers gag. Thane as Harpo. Did I steal that from Harpo? No, I, I came in with the hair. I came in like Harpo. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I was going to wear the same hair. It's funny. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, we, we could have done that mirror scene together. Yeah. Did you have to have that back by midnight? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's Groucho more than me. Yeah. He just channeled his inner <laughs> Groucho. Uh, what was I talking about? Anything? Yeah, we were, we were talking about how well read. Uh, oh, Brown. yeah, and, and, what a, that, and I have a treasured photograph that I think Erin, in her, one of her good days, sent me um, of Groucho reading the book Cabot, not posing for the picture. She <laughs> snapped it for, uh, with a cigar and reading the book. And he gave it to Friend. People forget he wrote for The New Yorker. Oh, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, in, in, in Robert Bader's book, Groucho Marx, another writer, whatever, uh, is um, uh, stuff that he wrote as far back as 1925 for The New Yorker, and later for The New Yorker, and College Humor and other magazines, uh, Atlantic or Harper's or whatever was existing then. Groucho appeared in, it seems. Uh, under, in the early ones, under the name Julius H. Marx. That's how much farther back it was. Uh, how far back it was um, than today. <laughs> but he loved to write, and he, he, I've got letters from him that are just <coughs> priceless. Unfortunately, they don't appear in his collected letters because I was afraid to send them to him. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get them back. Of all stupid things, I could have copied, he copied them and sent them to him. But, uh, he um, kept up a correspondence with his close friends. He would write to friends who were, lived two blocks away because he loved to write. James Agee, the great James Agee, said in a book about film, um, something to the effect that I often wonder if whole audiences catch some of Groucho's weirdest curves. Mm -hmm. And there are some selected out that uh, one for me took place in my life in a car. Uh, uh, my wife and I had dinner with Groucho and the great Harry Ruby, who wrote Three Little Words and a hundred other songs, you know. And they were great friends. And Groucho's in the back seat, and he said, uh, Harry, we stopped for a light after dinner. He said, Harry, that's the apartment building where your son lives. And Ruby said, no, it isn't Groucho. And he said, yeah, your son lives there, the one right there. He says, no, he doesn't live there, Groucho. He doesn't live there? He said, no, he lives over on Wiltshire. He doesn't live in that building? <laughs> no. It's funny, I ran into him the other day, and he never mentioned not living there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird curve. <laughs> <laughs> there, are a lot, there are a lot of those. Uh, my f uh, some, it's idiotic to say what's your favorite movie, your favorite guest, your favorite line, your favorite. But I, among my favorites, Groucho is not all that well known. I mean, everybody's heard about the anti Semitic Country Club and other things, but. No, this have they? Was, just let's get that. Well, maybe in. some people just, haven't. Well, there's some, yeah, please do the anti Semitic Country Which Club. Which is often misquoted. Okay, do it The right. original correct version is he went to a country club in, uh, in Hollywood, and he, had, <laughs> and he had his daughter with him and some friends, and he was going to go swimming. And as he indicated he was going to, um, a flunky came over and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Marks, but we, uh, 
we don't allow Jewish people in the pool. And Groucho said, really? You know, my daughter is only half Jewish. Can she go in up to her knees? <laughs> I mean, isn't that a lot better than getting mad and storming? <laughs> Now I forgot what the other one was. Oh, I was worried. Oh, I know, I know. There's a lot of friction while this movie was made, and it kept, kept as you know, got stopped and script rewrites, and it was a horrible mess, and there were fights over money, and Paramount was fighting the brothers, and they were getting sick of each other, and it almost didn't come out, and all kinds of things. Um, but on another movie, they were directed by a director whose last name was Wood, Sam Wood. And W-O-O-D, Wood the Normal Way. He didn't like Groucho, and Groucho detested him. And at one point, Mr. Wood made the mistake of insulting Groucho in front of the cast and crew. And said, um, the strange thing, he said, yeah, you, can't, you can't make an actor out of clay. And Groucho said, no, a director out of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Where, where do we get people like that today? Well, do we? I don't, I, I guess maybe not. You, you know more about the historical business context of this film, uh, the fact that it was the last they made for Paramount. Fifth film. And, uh, it's the, out of a five-picture deal. This was the last. This was the, very, the last one and the most troubled one, I guess. And the one right before at Horse Feathers was the most popular one, the most best box office. That made enormous amount of money. Now, my friend Bader, interestingly enough, who is, worships the brothers, is writing a book that he's about a thousand pages into now about their vaudeville years, and he said Groucho was, was uh, lied in effect about a couple of things, and. The word that this movie bombed is absolutely untrue, and he even found the receipts. It did very well, and it sort of suited seemingly Groucho's, um, it seems strange to say anything negative about Groucho, but his story of why they left Paramount was supported somewhat by having that movie not make a lot of money. And so uh, the reason that they didn't get a new contract with Paramount was that. Well, it did make a lot of money, but they did then move to MGM and the historic move where the great Irving Thalberg, boy genius, some dispute this, but I'm glad to see, uh, had them make Night at the Opera and others. And, and the fact that um, that isn't the reason they left Paramount is only historically interesting. But Thalberg thought their best movies were the first two, Coconuts and um, Animal Crackers. And, and Animal Crackers, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, memory. Uh, <laughs> And they had done those on the stage, as you may know, so that he thought the reason they succeeded was they knew where the laughs were from doing them on the stage, and that they uh, should then take the next movie and play it on the stage. And so they played scenes, you'll bear me out on this, from uh, Night at the Opera first, up and down the coast. And those that didn't work, they took out. Those they knew where the laughs were. And they, kept those, and there's an interesting fact that I mentioned to Groucho once about seeing Night at the Opera with a full audience one night and roaring, going back to the matinee next day at the movie theater, because I was an out-of-work actor, had nowhere to go. Uh, and I said, it seemed like their performance was a little off. And that's where I learned, he said, we were holding for laughs, because we played them for audiences, knew where the big laughs were, held an extra beat, which looks like poor timing on their part when you see it without an audience. <laughs> so that's interesting, if not hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about Ruby's uh, relationship, their close friendship with Groucho. I'm thinking about your buddy, your close friend, Woody Allen, <clears throat> once said about Groucho, I think he, I don't know if he said it to you or he said it publicly, that he thought, Groucho was the greatest entertainer, the greatest comedian of all time, because he simply did more than anyone else could yeah, do. Yeah, that's right. That, you, you've got it right. He, uh, <clears throat> it's vulgar to drink in front of others. <laughs> Come up here if you are thirsty. <laughs> yeah, he said Groucho had the greatest array of gifts 
of any comedian. <clears throat> his comic movement, his comic delivery, his timing, his sensitivity, his, his the tone with which he did a line. Uh, and he could sing. I mean, really, they, they were the four nightingales in their earliest days when their pushy mother shoved them onto stages and made money off of them. Uh, they were, in fact, they were the five nightingales, because as most people don't know, there were five Marx Brothers. Gummo. Uh, people forget Gummo. Zeppo left them at this transition, didn't he? When they went to MGM, there was no more Zeppo. And Thalberg had the nerve to say he was going to pay them less because there weren't as many Marx Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and there are two versions of what Groucho said. Right. My favorite is that that's absurd. You know, without Groucho, we're worth, or without Zeppo, we're worth more money. But the best version is, <laughs> is that you, you can't do that. We're, we're uh, you know, the four Marx Brothers were a million dollar act. And without Zeppo, two million. <laughs> <laughs> Zeppo couldn't wait to get out of show business and became an agent for. And or, what did he do? He, he, he I, I talked to Zeppo once. It's a sore memory because. Isn't this a story about you wanting to put him on the show because you couldn't believe how hilarious he was? Yes, he was so funny, and he said, "I know stories of Marx Brothers that have never been told." And somebody on my staff decided, he, and he wanted $5,000. Well, everybody who appeared in a talk show got the same scale. And it was illegal to do that. And I am so sorry we didn't do it. <laughs> but was he really that funny? Yes, he was funny. There was some rumor that he was the only one that made Groucho laugh. This, this could very well be, yeah. Groucho liked him very much. And, uh, <clears throat> and I had a weird feel, experience of talking to Z Gummo once on the phone, and I thought it was Groucho putting me on because it was it was Groucho's duplicate voice. You know, well, you sound like a nice young man, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, that was Gummo, who was quite a good performer apparently too. But they went on as the three. And the thing about Duck Soup partly is that it's the last of the Marx Brothers films that were what they were in vaudeville more and on the stage, where the only consideration was let the boys out there and who cares what happens, just let it go. Thalberg thought they should add romance so that women would go to the Marx Brothers movies with the same enthusiasm that men did. Why he thought only women like romance, I don't know. But, but was that either anecdotally or actually statistically true? More men went to see Marx Brothers? You know, Bro I don't know. I've never seen that <clears throat> said. But I've seen it said as part of Thalberg's thought that it, we would get a broader appeal of women uh, if there's <clears throat> a story. <clears throat> so they added the cloddish Alan Jones. Uh, <clears throat> if his relatives are here, I'm sorry. I've done that before. <laughs> um, in those dreary scenes that slow up um, the MGM films for me with some romance. Um, was Ellen Jones in two of them? And they had a little love story. Yeah. And, and what was it? It wasn't Night at the Opera. They took out a great Groucho song, I'm Dr. Hackenbush, uh, to put in a love scene. And that's one of the great artistic losses of our time, although Groucho sings it on records. Yeah. Would you do Hackenbush for us? No. <laughs> <laughs> With me? With you, yeah. if you wore a wig. Take every other line. <laughs> How do you know I don't? <laughs> um, no, but know, seriously, folks. I, I was out of the theater for a moment, so I, I heard the, the, uh, um, uh, the line about uh, that's how darkies are made. Oh, yes. That, but that, was the all gods chillin', is that out of there? I didn't see it. Did I miss the song? I the the phrase all gods chillin' is used in the big wild scene. Uh, oh, right. I might, chillin' is yeah. there. I heard it tonight. Did yeah. everyone hear and what that, we're talking about, the racially insensitive? And that line of Groucho's, and that's where darkies came from? Or yeah, that, that's oh, how darkies were born? Yeah, that's how darkies were born. Yeah. It but, cracks me up every time I hear it. I think it's now, hilarious. I, I, and, was, uh, I had read <laughs> that there was some thinking that when they were re-releasing the DVD, 
that yeah. they were, someone wanted to remove both of the, both the chill the chillin song and yeah. the darkies. Well, there were, are silly people everywhere, and um, <laughs> I, I say don't you dare touch anything in the Marx Brothers films, and with your ludicrous, you know, political correctness, go soak yourself <laughs> with water from it. <laughs> As we've just demonstrated. Um, so a number of people <laughs> have used Marx Brothers films or themes to hilarious effect. Again, your buddy Woody Allen did it several times. Yes. One of my, uh, uh, you know, I think Bananas looks like, you know, a send off of this mm -hmm. with the dictator and even a trial scene. There's even a trial scene. Oh, yeah. What, what he acknowledges that his debt to the brothers, to Groucho particularly, to Bob Hope, right. where Woody can point to 20 places in his <clears throat> movies where he so clearly does a Bob Hope line reading. Hey, how about that stuff? Isn't that something? <laughs> um. <laughs> and my colleague and good friend Joe Landau, who is here, reminded me that, uh, that this film plays in Hannah and her sisters. It's the reason not to Oh, that's right. The reason he doesn't commit suicide, he's watching Duck Soup. He's seeing Duck Soup. And he walks out, character walks out and says, right. I, I know why I shouldn't commit suicide. I just is there anything funnier than the mirror scene? And is there anything funnier in the mirror scene than the last bit where he Groucho spins around <laughs> and Chico goes like this, not <laughs> spinning around, and he doesn't see it. But it, it is interesting, though, that when you see the mirror scene, you realize with the mustache, the glasses, and a cap. Anybody can look like Groucho. Well, at least those three can. Yeah, you and I may be less. But Zeppo less so, clearly. You right? can tell, yeah. Those three, was but, what ha is that the same genetic make? What happened there? I don't know why, what that is. Why I, is Zeppo I, five inches taller than them, right? <laughs> he, doesn't, he, he doesn't look like them. Well, I know from my friend Bader that uh, there were times in, the, in vaudeville if one of the brothers was sick, and then, it, after, and then just for fun, right, I heard this. they did their entire act once, Harpo being, uh, you know, Chico being Groucho and Groucho being Chico. And Groucho did the Italian accent. And nobody knew, including the stage manager. <laughs> I mean, it was almost a private, a private joke. But, um, but I also read something that I just thought was incredibly improbable, that similarly, they could get Zeppo to play Groucho. Uh, to, he, uh, this is another bit of um, arcana from Bader. In Day at the Races, at some point, I think it's in that, that they g brought Zeppo in for something. And in the football game scenes in that, uh, was it, a, a Chico broke his ankle. And so in some of the scenes in the football game, Chico is taller than he is in others. <laughs> <laughs> and once, you never notice the first time, but once you know it and watch it, you can, you can have fun with that. It, um, again, what was another line tonight that I heard that I had forgotten about? Um, it's amazing, right? You could see this film many times mm -hmm. and say, oh my God, I didn't really hear it that one. I thought this movie had the, w w you and I and others were in the dean's office earlier, and it turned out it's some animal crackers. Uh, someone comes in and the, the dean is angry about something and someone says the dean is waxing Roth. And Groucho says, let Roth wax the dean for a while. <laughs> uh, that, that's a specific S.J. Perlman right. uh, line of theirs. I um, wish I could think of the line. I thought something, something about this movie. I forgot. I'll, I'll, I'll stall by talking about the Hayes Code. Oh, yeah, OK. The Hayes Codes is interesting, right? This is the forum on law, culture, and society. Did everyone get the, the reference of when the, that really hilarious, the second time that Harpo shows up in his Paul Revere costume, and he, mm -hmm. he goes to the blonde woman's house, and then you just see the his shoes, her shoes, and the horseshoes. Yeah, and yeah. And then you see Harpo in bed with the horse, uh, and yeah. she's in the other bed. Yes. Right, which was a completely a parody, a mocking of, of the Hayes, Hayes office and could, making could, it be used twin bed. Right. Explain oh. to because some of the people audience. People in real life never get in the same bed together, as we know. So this is the Marx Brothers mocking the Hayes Code. Yeah. Say that that you know. I know you know. Don't worry. It won't be a man and a girl in the same bed. It'll be a man and a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll give me with suggestion of the mm -hmm. hand, the boys' shoes, girls' shoes, horseshoes. Right. It'll make you think about it. There, what? There's um, a, another thing Groucho said that isn't precisely true, but it doesn't matter because it's so funny. It was on the great show that I, the, the best show that I did with him. Um, 
where it was only Groucho alone. He was fine on the others, too. There were other guests. He proposed marriage to Truman Capote on one of them. <laughs> uh, and, uh, said, but I might not be able to fulfill my duties. <laughs> he said that. And, and worried the ABC censor, yeah. Uh, but uh, what the hell was the one? Oh, yeah, it, I think it's in Night at the Opera. In any case, they're going up the ramp to the ship, and Margaret Dumont, dowager le leading, and turns back to Groucho and says, Rufus, have you got everything? I'll tell you, as Groucho told it, he said, and uh, Margaret Dumont, who never got any of our jokes, uh, and would have to say to me, Julius, why is this funny? <laughs> but anyway, uh, she turns to me and she says, um, Julius, have you got everything? And I say, I never had any complaints. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and that was censored in 14 states. I doubt it, but it might have been. And 14 is a funnier number than if he'd said five states. Yeah, the two-syllable thing is what Groucho would go for, knowing that's fun. For, there are funny and unfunny numbers, but that's for a separate essay. I, I, I forgot where I read that you wrote. It might have been actually, you know, have you haven't been reading Dick Cavett in the New York Times at least, what, twice a month? I'm doing it about twice or sometimes three weeks it's apart. It's the Opinionator it? column. Online. It's all online. Yeah. Yes, you but, won't find but it in there, the paper. But there's a virtue in that because it's longer. They give you more than 875 words, and so you do, I think you, you're, you run longer I've than... Gone under, I, the two columns I just did on Stan Laurel, uh, one of them ran 1,300, I think, right. the first one, and so many people loved it. that I, And then it triggered other things I remembered about him. That I, The second one is up now and for a while more. But I remember... Yeah, but yeah, go Cav ahead. Cavett, NY Times, will take you to them. But you, in one of the columns, I think it was around a year ago, you were talking about Groucho, and I wish I could remember the line, but you quoted a line that he said. And what you, it wasn't, you weren't pointing out that it was so funny. It was funny, but it was oh. the rhythm. The, you know, you, were you reminded it me when you said... You me? Yeah, well, you were saying the, the fact that 14 is funny and 5 is not. And yeah. then you said you realize, no, if you really break... This is a way a comedy writer would think, right? If you really look at the sentence and well, you saw day. the syllables, the way they lined up in a way. Yeah, I think I wrote that in, in something about him this year. Uh, it was um, those weeks on The Tonight Show. Oh, was that And one? I would take stuff down to Groucho and always hang in the office as long as I could, sitting in the office that Jack Parr had sat in and Johnny Wood. And um, I gave him a line, and he looked at it, and he said, it needs a sightening. I said, I'm sorry? It needs a sightening. And I'll just make up a line. That's one I used earlier. Instead of, you could have fooled me, it should read, you sight me, could have fooled me. And he da 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 <laughs> was the right rhythm right. for the line. And the word certainly pronounced by Groucho, sight me. <laughs> and that bothers me. People say, How the, Groucho said, sight me. No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, sight me. And Oliver Hardy didn't say, soivent. He said, sivent from Georgia, different, but similar. Right. Yeah. But the fact that Groucho knew the rhythm was slightly, <laughs> rhythm could be improved. You interviewed so many people over the years on your show, and you've met so many others, other famous people that you've met. Mm -hmm. You're going to miss the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you, got, oh, you have to be kidding. <laughs> um, Carry on. <laughs> right. <I'll, laughs> um, does anything compare to that first day that you actually met him at George Kaufman's funeral? No, there's nothing in, in my life that I can put with that. Explain, um, tell everyone how that happened, how that, and okay. then the walk on 81st, 5th, was it 81st and 5th Avenue, right? Yes. Uh, I read the Times one day, and it said George S. Kaufman died, and there was his obit. And, um, he was Groucho's god. And that's how Groucho always referred to him. In fact, Groucho, as he aged, didn't repeat things the way old folks like us who are over 40 do, um, except one thing. I don't think he ever told me something he'd told me three years before or five years before, except this one thing where he said, did I ever tell you my greatest compliment? And I said, the first time, of course, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, my greatest compliment. 
was when George Kaufman said to me, Groucho, you're the only actor I'd ever allow to ad lib in something I wrote. And that was my greatest compliment. And he would tear up a little each time. And I would pretend to hear it for the first time. <laughs> <each> time. <laughs> and so you, I never would have known from that day, I'll get to your, yeah. uh, have slid off what you asked for there, but uh, about four years ago, Miriam, his daughter, one of his two daughters, came to New York, 82 years old, uh, and I had gotten a letter from her saying, thank you 20 years late for the introduction you wrote to my father's book, uh, Love Groucho, Letters to Miriam when she was in college, Vassar, I think. And she said, I, I got delayed in thanking you because I was drunk for 15 years. <laughs> and, uh, and she was. And um, we had lunch. And then this letter came from her thanking me for lunch and saying, about five lines down, my eye leapt like a magnetic force down the letter to the line, my father thought the world of you. Hmm. Oh, it's getting to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and so the day I met, I got Red Kaufman's uh, uh, obit, I went to work at The Tonight Show. And they said, we're sending you tonight to the Blue Angel. There's a new comic there named Woody um, Allen. And uh, he wrote for Sid Caesar when he was a teenager. And I hated him immediately. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I called him at the Blue Angel and said, the Tonight Show wants me to scout you. So he said, where to meet him? And I did. And I saw his act. And the audience didn't care for it very much. And he was new and scared, hid behind the mic, and the audience talked during his act. But I knew, standing in the back, that like an arc came from him to me, that mo every joke in his 25, 30 minutes on stage was, would have been the best joke in any other comedian's act. It was just genius stuff. So we met, and I said, why do you sit out here afterwards as people went by? And he said, I, I, I make myself do it um, because it's uh, toughening me, I hope. Uh, but I hear them come out and say the guitar player was great, but Jesus, that comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived through that. He threw up before going on sometimes. So then I changed the subject to shame about Kaufman. And he said, yeah, this has ruined my day. Um, Woody used to go and look at the door of George S. Kaufman's house on 56th Street, is somewhere in there. Yeah. And I have too. Uh, so I went to the funeral the next day, and Woody didn't show. So I put on my only suit, and I went, and it was uh, full. And then they opened a little side room, and they let 30 more people in. And I sat down, and the coffin was over there. Moss Hart was ready with his eulogy. And um, I looked, and there sat Julius H. Marks, four feet from me, with a cigar, unlighted, um, looking like Groucho Marx. There was no doubt who it was. And it just thousands of volts went through me. And afterwards, I made a point of catching him at the corner of Fifth Avenue and uh, 81st. 70, wherever we were there, yeah. And uh, Abe Burroughs and Art Carney left Groucho there and went their ways. And I went up and said, Groucho, I had a witty line ready. I said, I'm one of your biggest fans. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, well, if it gets any hotter, I could use a big fan. <laughs> that was the beginning of our uh, relationship. And he, he almost it sounded like the game show, as he always called it. Uh, you bet your life. It, it, after we walked down Fifth Avenue to 59th, he said, well, you seem like a nice young man. And I expected, and I hope you do well in the quiz, for those who remember the game show. But he said, I'd like you to have lunch with me. So we had lunch in the plaza in the Oak Room. I, I remember which booth it was. I remember his saying to the Metro Deed, do you think they have any fruit in the kitchen? I mean, besides the chef. <laughs> and, uh, and 
then uh, I, I, I complimented him on the, I can't think of the word, but there are writers here who know, or my wife will probably know, or my friends will know. At the beginning of a book, when you turn two pages and there's a quote from, say, Oscar Wilde or somebody that the epigram. author sold, The epigraph, thank you. Go to the head of the class. Right. Thank you. I, I will do well on the quiz. <laughs> well, you lost the big money. But, uh, <laughs> and this one was, oh, I think it was, there's something not altogether unpleasant in the misfortunes of our friends, La Rochefoucauld. And I complimented him on it, and I said, this is a weird thing, but someone gave me a book of great French quotes the other day, and the first one I turned to was, uh, I said, may I do it as it was? He said, yes. Il y a quelque chose un peu plaisant dans les malheurs de nos amis. And he said, well, you speak excellent French. Eh? You could only have lined it in a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my first compliment. <laughs> Oh, and then, the, the, and then was was the Tonight Show uh, part that you you kept in touch with him in between that period between that and the yeah, time? well after that he happened to be one of the people who hosted the Tonight Show in the stock company summer between Parr and Carson so there we were reunited um, he referred to comedy writers as Shakespeare's three of us were in his office once the phone rang and he said look I'm talking to three Shakespeare's and I've got to go. <laughs> and it, it was an old vaudeville term really for an theater for, for writers. Uh, he said Harpo inherited all my mother's good qualities. That everyone, everyone loved Harpo. Not everyone loved Groucho who knew him, including some of his relatives. Um, but they all loved Harpo. And someone told me, he has a great, uh, Har Harpo's son, Bill Marx, is a, one of the best people I've ever met. He has a book out, too, about Harpo's, being Harpo's son. And uh, he said when uh, they'd have a party and a room full of people at Harpo's house, and he had adopted four children, um, but when a stranger's child or a dog came into a crowded room, they went straight to Harpo. It never failed, he said. And you, you, you can see that in him in a way, I think. And yes, he could talk. <laughs> <laughs> Was, uh, is Duck Soup your favorite of the Marx Brothers films? You know, I think watching it tonight, I realized how much I love it, but also how much I love uh, Night at the Opera, uh, despite Alan Jones, <laughs> and with uh, Kitty Carlisle singing, uh, I think I made Kitty Hart, Carlisle Hart, some money. She was one of my first shows, and I said, here you were in a Marx Brothers movie. You must be, you, you should go to campuses. They'll eat you up because of that. You should lecture on being with the Marx Brothers. And she said, are you serious? She didn't know about the fanatical following at that time uh, for the brothers, and she did it. She went on the road. Never <laughs> gave me a cent. <laughs> Let, yeah. let, let's talk about your show for all those years. Uh, oh, that. Your favorite, yeah, I want to talk a little. Your, yeah. your favorite of the interviews, yes. <laughs> what, 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 what were the, some of the favorite of the Dick Cavett? Oh, thank you for saying some of them, because yeah. you can't pick a winner. Yeah, no, I didn't think you When you have could. many people, as right. you obviously sensed. Um, but uh, I, 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 when I get asked, I, get, I say, if pushed to the wall, certainly Groucho meant the most to me. And people will say, uh, most people think I'm going to say Hepburn, which was great and really historical in its way. Because she threw me by just coming in to check the studio out in the afternoon and then was going to come back Friday. And instead she said, well, why don't we just do it now? <laughs> and so we did for three hours. Couldn't shut her up. <laughs> On YouTube, you can find Catherine Hepburn rearranges Cavett's furniture. <laughs> I secretly taped her. This was foolish, because we two years to try to get her on. And then she said she'd come in and check the studio, and she said, you know, if, if it's no good, we'll just burn the tapes. And I said, oh, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thousands of greenbacks winging out the window. 
Um, and they were remarkable. But she came in and, and started moving stuff around. And I said, she probably won't do the show. She never has. Let's tape her visit. And then we'll have a souvenir. We won't tell anybody. Privately circulate it. So she came in and she said, what's this for? That orange carpet is terrible. And what is this? <laughs> there was a little wooden fence behind the chair. And she wanted to know what it was for. And she said, I don't think we need this. Why don't you un just you know, take that out? And a stagehand said, well, you'd have to unscrew the whole thing. Don't tell me what's wrong. Just fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? And then she did the show. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Oh, Brando, in his interesting way, um, it's, uh, it's a story I have to tell elsewhere in Vanity Fair or The New Yorker or something sometime. I don't know why I've done it before. Because afterwards, we went down to Chinatown. Ron Galella bugged us in a dark Chinatown street. Marlon wanted to find a, I, I was calling him Marlon by then. Uh, a place that he uh, had known when he was a New York actor, a Chinese restaurant. We were too late. It looked like a closed set of Chinatown on the Paramount lot or something. And Galella appears and made the mistake of following us for about a block with his assistant. And Marlon said, what's one of Galella? <laughs> and I said, uh, the, the bigger one. Is that Galella? Yeah. Uh, I'll cut to. Two blocks later, still walking, hoping we can get rid of him. Galella says, uh, hey, Marlon, take the sunglasses off. And I thought, hmm. And um, Marlon said, do you know what a slip punch is or a sneak punch? He does it in two movies in the middle of a sentence. Marlon said, don't you get tired of taking the same picture all the time? And Ron Galella went, what? <laughs> Marlon said, don't you ever get tired of <laughs> And he shot that, lifted him an inch off the ground, face down, crash on the hood of a car without putting his hands down first. Few stuntmen can do that one. <laughs> and uh, broke his jaw clean through. And the aftermath of this story is another two hours of adventure uh, and lawsuits and hospitals and a swollen hand. And the fact that I may have saved his life. Uh, the next morning, he had, I had put peroxide on it that night. And you ne must never do that with a puncture wound. Um, it's bad. I guess it kills tissue or something. Anyway, uh, the next morning, his hand was grapefruit size. And oh, I've had this before. I had breakfast with him. And I, I called my doctor. He said, get him over here, whatever he's wearing, if, even if nothing, quick. And he was in for a couple days. Later referred to it as the best 46000 he ever spent. <laughs> Not on the hospital. <laughs> um, anyway, that's an interesting story. You, you get Marlon Brando and you get more than. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's the greatest actor I ever saw. Um, and I'm not alone, of course. Um, most interesting, strange, haunted, odd man. And he and Orson Welles both achieved 400 pounds and died. Yeah. Who, uh, in that order. Who, who hadn't you interviewed that you wish you had? Cary Grant, <coughs> Frank Sinatra. Cary Grant, I, it's my fault, I think. He was wavering. But he said, oh, Kate was so damn good, and they'll all find out how dumb I am. <laughs> I had the taste to say, Mr. Grant, you can only be so dumb. <laughs> 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 and I'm happy to report that he laughed. <laughs> or else I did, I forget. <laughs> Sinatra, I had nice meetings with at various Friars Club events and things. Made him laugh hard once. And uh, then at a certain point, they gave me a number in New Jersey to call. New Jersey's a hint here. <laughs> and I got some guy who said, uh, I don't know who the hell you are. Frank doesn't do shit like this. And, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I 
said, excuse me, are you a man or a woman? <laughs> I wish I'd said that, I didn't. <laughs> so I don't know if Frank ever got the word that, that you were interested. We'd have had more fun, and certainly Cary Grant would have not been disgraceful, as you know. But he had that insecurity about it, which led to his famous quote when Sven said to him, oh, God, I'd give anything to be Cary Grant. And he said, so would I. <laughs> he took LSD. He did all kinds of things. He was a very unhappy man in a lot of ways, but not on the screen. I don't know whether you watch any of the present day nighttime talk show hosts. Um, I don't know if any of them are interesting to are you. Are there? Other yeah, talk shows? I don't watch any. <laughs> but I wonder what you think about uh, an era, the era of the Dick Cavett show, when it was special to actually have a guest who read books, to have a host who read books oh, and was yeah. witty and, and erudite and could bring on both politicians and Nobel Prize winning yeah. poets and could actually have a witty, engaging conversation instead of just mere sound bites and, yeah. and pablum. And well, I like the way you laid that out in the introduction. Who was it? You said I'd have somebody, maybe Buddy Hackett and Saul Bellow. Right, right. Um, because I never, ever was dumb enough to set out to do an intellectual show, a word you want to shed instantly in television. And when people, Europeans who would see me would go, your television's only intellectual. And I'd say, please, God. <laughs> uh, I had, uh, you know, I had Groucho Marx on last night. I had Buddy Hackett. I had Phyllis Diller. I didn't know that. Because the, nothing could scare a network more than that word. But uh, once they bitched because I had, um, who was it on some author that I kept on for the full show? And this was a day after they had said, get bigger names. I forget the order. Anyway, I, the next two nights back to back, one with a famous comedy star, I remember who it was, and one with the author of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. And he outrated, outrated the other one. Great, got, the show got a higher overnight rating. Johnny and I were great friends, so it's with re reluctance that I report that sometimes I heard from staff members who were still there when I worked there would say, Johnny would say, how come Cavett got Sophia Loren last, so Sophia Loren last night and we got uh, J.P. Morgan, the singer or something? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against her, I liked her. But it, it, I, I got everybody, otherwise everybody, I was told I never would get and that I really ever wanted. Are you surprised or not surprised at the level of discourse the, that you hear now on talk shows? I'd have to wear a dunce cap to comment on all of the talk show people today, all of whom I know. <laughs> and I just love some of them. But do, I, That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about something. When, when, they, when they speak to you, yeah. since you know them all, do they say, you're the guy that I always wanted to model? I wanted to always be Dick Cavett? I think one day they might. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're not doing it. I'm hoping They're not for doing it. the Dick Cavett show. Yeah, uh, maybe I should. Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder, it would be interesting to actually have you on a guest, as a guest, on one of those shows and to see how that worked. I had a great time with Jimmy Fallon and uh, partly he had me on because I was the first person who called him and uh, on his first night oh, wow. and said good luck. I just thought it was a good idea. I, didn't, I, <laughs> I wasn't trying to get on anybody's show and I've done that and I've been on with Letterman and if you want to see something hilarious, type Google and explain to the people next to you who don't know what Google means, Dick Cavett, Eddie Murphy. Can everyone remember that? Dick, do I need to say it again? <laughs> You'll find what was called the funniest talk show segment of the year. And I got an old disc of it. It was Dave's early Letterman show. And I sent it to him. And uh, he said it seemed like a hundred years ago watching it, and he just loved it. And, it, 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 it. and I said this was called the funniest talk show segment of the year in some magazine, but they didn't say whether it was January of 
that year that they said it in, <laughs> or uh, how far into the year to be flattering. But it's a killer. It's funny in a way that neither of us, I don't think, ever, we hit something off together and we had just met. And, um, going back to Groucho's funeral, for the merest moment, as the British say, it was a wonderful moment when Moss Hart, impeccable as always, in a, a kind of a white dinner jacket, um, stood before the coffin of his partner and took out the papers from his pocket. And before he started the elegant eulogy, he said, I just heard George's voice back there saying it needs cutting. <laughs> And if you remember the book Act One, that was one of George's favorite. Let's take um, some questions from the audience. Let's yeah, why should we do all of that? Yeah, goddamn let's work? see. Let's ask. <laughs> uh, yep. All right, where's our microphones? Question. Yeah, no, where are we? Anybody? Come on, how can you not want to? Oh, they're right there. Yeah, you'll hate yourself when you get home. Yeah, you'll want anything. to say, I had an opportunity to ask Dick Cabot a question. Personal, anything you want. <laughs> Don't spare our feelings. I would like to know. Do you think do you think the Marx brothers would have had a chance today? What do you think they would have done today? What did you say? Well, I was wondering what the Marx brothers today, if they were performing today, how oh. would they do? I don't know. I don't think you can do that. You know, I mean, almost everything is a product of its time. Um, I suppose somebody could decide we're going to bring back the Marx brothers with our act. I, I think it's embedded in the history of the world. At, the, at that time, and what produced it was true then. Uh, they are funny now, uh, but I don't know if that's what, if I think that's what you're asking, whether that school of comedy, or if they, if they came along now, you have to assume they'd be just as talented as they were then. Would they, would they change their style for the, for the cultural era, do you think? Uh, the, the, I guess they would have to. Say that again? Would they change their approach? I mean... Oh, I, uh, you'd have to ask them. I really don't know if they'd change their approach. Uh, I'm asking someone who knew them. <laughs> I, mean, I think they'd, they'd be smart enough to uh, read the headlines and see how funny George Romney is. I mean, Mitt Romney is. <laughs> Boy, that dated myself, didn't I, George Romney? Yeah. There, uh, was, there was another Romney. We'll mm -hmm. go over here, and then we'll come there, sir. Any political questions? Yeah, right here. There's a timorous hand. <laughs> There we go. Hi, um, did Grouch ever discuss with you his argument with the Warner Brothers over Knight and Casablanca? Well, uh, Knight and Casablanca. The yeah, Knight that, and Casablanca. That was when they were really tapering off, I think. Yeah, and, but uh, he, it was that in the Love Happy. Um, I mean, that was terrible. And <laughs> in the book, The Groucho Letters. Yes. Are you, okay. That book. He discusses, well, he, the letters are in there about the Warner Brothers are complaining to the Marx Brothers that they're using Casablanca in the oh, night in Casablanca. Yes. You know that story? People thought they were irreverent and, and using Casablanca and trading well, yeah, on Yeah, and, and it, they're going back and forth in letters. His are always funny and going off on these strange tangents. In his final letter to them, he says, oh, but we're going to sue you. You're right. Right? Because we were brothers before you guys were. That's right. <laughs> You, you, that, was, that was the end of the letters. They never sent any more yeah, letters. Yeah, you just sent me back to reading that book again. I, I, I love that. that was, <laughs> yeah, there are always witless types who are going to, well. Let's try this gentleman, and there was a woman in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, do tapes survive of the late night shows, we, aside from the ones that are issued in the magnificent five boxes? Uh, in, in my case? Yeah. Or from, of anybody? From the ABC shows. Well, the morons at NBC wiped out all of Johnny Carson's New York years. Uh, and he was in uh, no, rage I'm thinking in particular your show. The show to did. all your ABC Your ABC shows. ABC no, I, have, shows. I have those, owing to probably a mistake in the part of the legal department. Do they all survive and will, so, they be, uh, will more be of, issued? Most of them are there. And what, was, what did you say? Will more be issued? I, I, I was particularly... Uh, that's a, I hope so. Uh, there are five boxes out now. I was particularly and interested they, in the yeah. shows you did in London in the early 70s. There was a, you had some wonderful British entertainment guests on those yeah. shows. Who well, for, if you have old folks in your family who remember me um, fondly, <laughs> I love when people go up and say, my parents 
wouldn't let me stay up late. Uh, someone who looks like you. No. My parents wouldn't let me <laughs> stay up late. It wasn't my parents, late. it was me. You know, <laughs> Maybe you were one of them. I was one of those people. Yeah. No, I was just or, curious if any of those will or, ever They appear. rigged a TV under their covers and watched me because they were supposed <laughs> to be in bed. But, but uh, you know, I have the, and uh, Hollywood greats and the John and Yoko shows and all the rock people that came on the shore on another box and the comedians one is killing. The, the Hollywood greats, I, I was on a radio show about it the other day. It's box number five, Amazon Dick Cavett show. <laughs> I'm not plugging it, of course. Of course not. <laughs> but a guy said, uh, do you have it in front of you? And I said, yeah. And he said, who's on that again? And I read, um, I'll blow it now, but uh, uh, well, we have Katherine Hepburn, Betty Davis, Fred Astaire, Groucho Marx, Robert Mitchum, Orson Welles, uh, Lucille Ball, Marlon Brando, John Huston, Mel Brooks, and Frank Capra, and somebody else. And then I looked at it again and I thought, they're all dead. <laughs> One of them's alive. Who was it? Oh, I didn't name him. Uh, Kirk Douglas. That ninety. Uh, Mel, Mel's still alive. Mel's, and, Mel Brooks is alive. And, and, well, yeah, well, I mean, of the one-person shows, all of those were dead, and it d led to the commentator to say, who are their counterparts today? Yeah. Hard to say. Over here, in the middle. Mel's in a uh, show in that box of five directors. Capra, Robert Altman, yep. How did you decide um, to bring a particular author on your show? Um, how did you figure out that them being able to write was go also going to mean them being able to talk? How did I figure out whether they, uh, how they could talk? Uh, yeah, right. that as fact, well as write. That they would be interesting as... That's a, as people are taught to say, and these people who coach you on how to be on a talk show always say that's an, a very good question. <laughs> if you notice how politicians always say that to some I stupid question answer. like... <laughs> um, <laughs> but. One of the traps when you do your talk show, as everyone will, obviously, <laughs> one day, uh, authors have always, often cannot talk, and it's a shock. And that mellifluous prose that flows so f like a beautiful stream, and they, uh, duh, not quite that bad, but total disbelief on your part that they could have produced those words in that order and in that way. Um, and then the grand exceptions, of course, were at the top, Gore Vidal, who had on a lot. And Capote was an inter interesting talker. But you always had to adjust to the fact that the, when he came out and sat down, and the applause ended, a laugh was about to occur when he opened his mouth <laughs> every time. Hey, I'm sure ain't time to be working for him. <laughs> It would be like that, and then you'd go on. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, oh, no, no, I did say it. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was thinking the eulogy coming out of Moss Hart's pocket. Yeah, that's a real trap. The gift of writing is not synonymous with talking. And sometimes a bum writer is a good talker. Yeah. Um, this is going to be tough. Oh, wait, we have one there. Oh, yeah, we have two people. So there's, yeah, right here, this woman. See, there's still people out there. I can't oh, yeah. tell from the light. We'll try to get you back in the corner Hi, now. Uh, I miss you very much, very, very much. Every time I look at Charlie Rose, I wish for you to be back. She uh, misses Is you. there any possibility that you would? I'm commit? right here. You can see me. No, I mean every night. I'm, I could lie in bed and watch you then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wait a minute. Doesn't anyone love you enough to have given you the five boxes of Kevin? <laughs> You must have a husband, a son, a daughter, a relative, no, no. a partner. No, no, your your charm, and your guests. Uh, and the other question I wanted to get in, uh, there were actually two more. One is that story about the Marx Brothers uh, in Irving Thalberg's office when he was giving them a hard time and didn't show up, that they built a, a campfire in the middle of the office and took off all their clothes and they were roasting marshmallows. Oh, yeah. You're almost entirely accurate. They were potatoes. Oh. <laughs> but they were naked, and that's how 
That's how the great director, uh, producer found them in his office, <laughs> having kept them. And Groucho said, you know, we nearly left. I thought, you know, we were huge, we were huge stars in vaudeville, making huge, big money. We didn't need the movies. I'm glad they did them. Last yeah. question, and I'm not going to go on. Does everybody long. know the story of Groucho at the seance? Raise your hand. No, if you do. please tell. Do you want to tell it or shall I? <laughs> oh, I'll. Oh, I, 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 maybe, it, you might recognize it, in which case you can tune out. I'll make it quick. He said we were in vaudeville, and Chico and I were in the dressing room after the show, and the, an old Jewish couple came in. And they said, you're, you boys are Jewish, aren't you? And we thought you might like a traditional Friday night dinner. I told this on the show, on a show one. And the next day, Chico, and that's how it's pronounced, and Groucho were walking. Chico with his great gambler, disastrous gambler's addiction, but mind for numbers, said the number of that house, they said, was 1423. That's what that house is. Maybe we're accidentally walking past it. And this was two days before Friday night. So they went up to the door. I'll kind of go into Groucho now. And Groucho said, so we went to the door, and uh, we rang the bell. And the two lovely young ladies came to the door. And, and the couple had these two very pretty daughters. Well, thanks to Chico's magic with women, within five minutes, we were in bed with the two daughters. <laughs> And like a Fado farce, he said, being well read, the parents came home early, early and opened the bedroom door. And we grabbed up our clothes, and luckily we were on the first floor, and we went out the window. But Chico's face appeared momentarily, saying, I hope this doesn't affect Friday night. <laughs> Um, yes, the, over there, sure. How old were you when you met Groucho? And I'm over here, up here. Yep, yeah, back there. Hi. I'm safe. Oh, right. there you are, yeah. How old were you when you met Groucho? And um, how did you meet him? Why? And what did you oh. think of Lucille Ball? Well, I met Groucho at George S. Kaufman's funeral. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, did you just come in and get that right? No, no, she, I, think, I think she just wanted to know how old you were then. Oh, how old I was. It was, uh, let's see, it was about 20 years ago. I was 14. <laughs> in fact, I'm trying to think how old I must have been. Let's see. That would have been, what did we decide that was? Uh, 60. Well, one, we're uh, saying, we said the. the around 60. Well, 69. That was, was 20. Six, twenty-seven, maybe? Because this would have been 1963, one, right? Oh. God, wasn't I not? Oh, yes, it would have been. I was still writing for Jack Parr. Yeah. None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> how old was Groucho? How old would Groucho have When you were 27, how old was Groucho? He died in uh, 67. While you're doing those numbers, Chico, uh, I was thinking about how I don't think the room realized when you told about Aaron Fleming that she was over, yeah, oh, he was over 50 years older than her. 50 it, years older than Aaron. He was 50 years was, older yeah. than Aaron. I mean, she was really yeah, a she kid. She was a strange mixture of neurosis and uh, minor acting talent and aggressiveness and uh, psychosis <laughs> and was a a blessing and a horror for Groucho. And it led to a, a lawsuit, since we're the forum on law, culture, and society, right? Uh, because yeah. she, the, 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 there was a will contest, mm -hmm. and Groucho's three children. Got involved, in, yeah. It was involved in a will contest, and she, you know, and she yeah. actually had people testifying, right? She had famous actors. Well, there was a big trial with the Bank of America right, suing Bank of, her. Yeah, Aaron Fleming versus and Bank of America. I think there's a bit on YouTube of her fighting with a guard, not giving up her purse to be searched. And I was just thinking, you have to have some personality, don't you? To have a trial and have a jury decide in favor of the Bank of America. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about anybody? She was a tragic case, and she blew her brains out a few years ago. She went from living in Groucho's luxury house to being a kind of 
panhandler along the Sunset Strip. Yeah, thank you for remembering. She wanted to know what did you think of Lucille Ball? Oh, I loved Lucy. Oh, that sounds sunny. <laughs> <laughs> And Lucy loved me, and she, she told Bill Paley, you were stupid to give Late Night to Merv Griffin, you should have given it to Dick on CBS. Um, and, uh, he, but he didn't. Uh, but I, I met him later, but I didn't ask him why not. But she just adored me. Um, funny how people are, isn't it? <laughs> I can give you people who didn't if you want to balance that off. I, 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 <clears throat> do, do you think everyone's had enough? No, we'll do, we'll do one more question. Okay. Do you have a guest who would just horrify you with the bombs on your show? Do you ever have a guest who just throw you in there too? Uh, one guest bombed rather dramatically by dropping dead, <laughs> uh, literally. But that's another long story and can be found in one of my columns. Uh, it's, all these, by the way, are still there in the Times or in my book, which is <clears throat> called Talk Show, which that's the name of the, well. That's what the Times chose to call my column, though it's not all about. So, but 75 pieces are in there. Three about Richard <clears throat> Nixon that'll kill you, and uh, especially the middle one. And uh, that, oh, on YouTube too, you Google Nixon White House wants revenge on Cabot Show, and you can see me on the Nixon, on the Nixon tapes with his lick spittle H.R. Haldeman uh, and Nixon saying, Cabot, how can we screw him? <laughs> His hobby was illegally screwing people uh, with the IRS, which he did to my staff, and I didn't find it out till later. Yeah. Is he still dead? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I, can't, I can't help but remark when I heard you talk about Miriam Kaufman and how you got, yourself got teary when you think about the words that her father, her father had, had said about you. And about I, I can, the world of I can tell about. you, I have, a, I have a similar anecdote. Uh, uh, the, uh, I do a series also at the 92nd Street Y. You know what it's called? Yeah. The yeah, talk sure. show. You, yeah, know you, you took my words. Yeah, they took, it's called the talk show. I, <laughs> I didn't steal it. They took it. And if you look, go on the 92nd Street Y's website, and it says... Oh, can we get the... Uh, how many of those are on there? <laughs> no, no, no. no. The, the, what's on there is they announce the series that I do for them, and it says, in the grand tradition of Dick Cavett. I'll sue them. <laughs> So, so I get teary every time I see that. I can tell oh, you. Oh, that's that. very so nice. Cool. So before we You're say carrying my name, yes, admirably. I'm going to continue to do it, Dick. Thank you, but you'll, you'll never be replaced. You're I can't help thinking those people leaving because he, I promised to tell Groucho in the seance and I didn't. Can I do it real fast? Yeah, do it. Okay. I, I veered off. It's another one that starts. We were in vaudeville and out, uh, uh, and uh, Groucho. Off stage had no mustache, so he wasn't recognizable at all. If you've ever seen a picture of him without either the real one or the old one, you don't know who it is. Um, and anyway, um, I think they were in Minneapolis. I'm standing up because my leg went to sleep. Um, <laughs> and um, he was asked if he had any interest in the supernatural. And he said, yeah, a reasonable amount. And they said, you want a, a great famous trance medium will be appearing in someone's private home here. And many of the faithful will be there. And if you can behave yourself, um, you can come. And he said, well, you know, I'm an idiot off the stage, but I, I, I can be serious. And I'm interested in the supernatural. And, you know. So they went. And I picture it, a woman who looked like Margaret Dumont. <laughs> and the house lights were down, and the devout were all hushed and sitting there. And she went into her trance, and she said, I am in touch with the other world. Does anyone, does anyone have a question? And a familiar voice said, what is the capital of North Dakota? <laughs> Good job. Thank you, man. That was good. Very good. Thank you.